Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, it was three years ago that I gave my first grand rounds on COVID-19, and then two or three weeks later, uh, we had two or three more grand rounds, and that was the last one for the season. And so uh, there's been a lot of transition since then. So those of you who are here then, thank you for your support. Those of you who are new faces, you're welcome to the University of Louisville. Um, in that span of time, I have acquired my boss and mentor, Julio Ramirez's position as chief. Um, his boss, the chair, has been replaced. His boss has been, will be retiring in July 1st. Her boss, the provost, became president, and now is back to provost, and the president has moved on. So a lot of transition going on, which means there's a lot of retiring, and you young people, you're it. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna talk about this triple demic, RSV, influenza, and COVID-19. It's a lot about COVID-19. I've been given the tall order of giving an interesting lecture about COVID-19 three years into the pandemic, okay? So I wanna honor your presence by trying to do a good job today. And one of my goals is to keep your attention, all right? And then um, towards the end, we'll talk some about RSV and influenza. We're going to start with a case. All right, Jason, which key? These are my uh, conflicts of interest. I can tell you the first two vaccine trials were no longer, we're past the uh, phase where we include people. So let's start with a case. 55-year-old white female presents with a history of smoking, COPD. She's not on HOMO2. She has a complaint of fever, nausea, sore throat, shortness of breath, general malaise, familiar symptoms, and admitted for hypoxia with an O2 saturation of 83% on room air. Two days before admission, she, her symptoms began and she did a home antigen test for COVID-19 that was negative. She stayed mostly in bed the next day, but when uh, she couldn't do her activities of daily living any longer because she lives alone, she presented to the ER. In the ER, her vital signs were stable. They put her on oxygen and her saturation was 96%. This was her pharynx, healthy tonsils, no erythema or exudate. Her chest x-ray shows one of somebody who's a chronic smoker with expanded lung volumes, a flattened diaphragm, and a... Uh, quite aortic uh, shadow there that uh, doesn't go with COPD, but probably more her diet. Anyway, uh, the differential for this is one that's familiar to all of us. And it's very difficult to discern one virus from another when somebody has these types of infections. The top three um, viruses would be your RSV, influenza, and COVID-19. Our short panel here at UofL tests for those three. If you get a long panel, you're also going to get the adeno, paraflu, metanumo, enero, and rhinovirus. But she could have a virus to a non-testable um, virus, such as Boca virus or one of 100 others. Her differential includes some non-infectious things or non-viral, like mycoplasma. And so that's where we start today, hopefully a place where you can relate to seeing a patient uh, that has symptoms like that. Today, I'm going to give the current state of the viral season give it a historical context that I think makes uh, this talk more interesting, go over some treatments, some vaccines, and try to answer the question, why triple-demic? Now, you heard a hundred times in the beginning of the pandemic that it was unprecedented. How many times did we hear that word? Too many, too many times. But uh, let me tell you, it, it wasn't the first pandemic, right? There's been dozens of others. Diphtheria is one, and I'm going to try to tell the story of COVID-19 through diphtheria. So it's called Carini bacterium diphtheria. Diphthera means leather, and look at the back of this throat. Now, it looks like if you just give one big cough, you hock that thing out of there, and you'll be done with diphtheria. But it's much worse than that. Um, the physicians at the time, 100 years ago, some of, they would try uh, tracheostomies, and the children would just asphyxiate right before their very eyes. It was a devastating infection. And so um, they, they lived through that. And uh, let me tell you the story. 
It was written about by none other than Noah Webster in 1735. And he said that the infection would move through the colonies and just strip the colonies of children. Then 1821, it was named by Pierre Bretonneau. 1883, it was identified by Edwin Klebs of Club Ciela and Friedrich Loeffler, not of Loeffler syndrome. They used, um, in 1888, the toxin was identified by Emile Roux and Alexander Yersin. And then 1891, there's some studies I'm gonna go over with you in just a second by Emil Bering and Shiba Saburo Katsato. And they studied tetanus and applied those to uh, diphtheria. In 1901, Emil von Bering was awarded the Nobel Prize when he um, successfully transmitted, I mean, transferred the antitoxin and saved the life of a child. So when you win the Nobel Prize, you get a von before your name. So he became Emil von Bering. Then just as a, a matter of um, relation here, Grover Cleveland's daughter died of diphtheria. And I put the age of 12 because it seemed kind of old to me. I'm not a pediatrician, but a 12 year old, that, that's a decent sized girl and, and overcome with the asphyxiation and died. Now let's look at COVID-19. You know, coronaviruses were discovered in 1966 and then December 12th, was when the media started talking about this unidentified pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan that seems to be related to a seafood market. And then uh, two months later, SARS-CoV-2 is named by the taxonomy committee and COVID is given the name by the WHO. And so by um, February 20th, it's identified by whole genome sequencing and the Chinese post it online for free. So in the span of two months, you, you have an unidentified infection and then whole genome sequencing. Whereas diphtheria, we started talking about it 1735 and the whole genome sequencing was performed in 2003. So what happened in well over 200 years with diphtheria happened in a span of two months with COVID-19. And I think we need to appreciate how fast this was occurring. We have electron micrographs of the COVID-19. Then uh, Caitlin Carrico, you may or may not have heard of her, she was the front runner for the Nobel Prize, almost got it. So no Von Carrico for her. Um, then our presidents, Trump and Biden, each got COVID-19 while in office, as you recall. So let's go over this antitoxin. Uh, 100 years ago, actually in 1904, it was the 11th uh, cause of mortality in the United States. And they would take a diphtheria patient, isolate the toxin, and then weaken it. And... Uh, inject it several times into healthy mice or guinea pigs, and then extract some serum, a very small amount, and give it to guinea pigs who had been exposed to the real diphtheria, and those guinea pigs lived. Okay, well, it wasn't enough to give a child, so they, they transferred it to a horse, and that provided enough serum to actually give a child who had diphtheria, and the child lived. So you know you work a lot for a case report and the only written report of uh, going over this is scribbled on the edge of this photograph by Von Bering's assistant. So hopefully you're a little more organized when you do your case reports. And what this scribble says is that uh, there was a nurse who said to Von Bering, hey, I have a child. You said you wanted to know about the next time somebody, a little somebody had uh, diphtheria for one of your studies. And he said, great, I wanna give her my antitoxin. And he said, you got IRB for that? Not necessarily. Back then it was so free. So it was a wonderful story in the sense that these parents brought the child who was so sick, he gave the antitoxin to a human for the first time. And the Christmas present four days later is that she's uh, so much better and you could tell she was gonna live and she did. So for COVID-19, we had COVID-19 patients, their blood was taken to the blood bank, and then this convalescent plasma was transfused to patients um, who had COVID-19. Now, you remember the tracheostomies that they were doing and failed with diphtheria, but they had the feeling like, I just wanna do something. Well, we had the same feeling, right? With the beginning of COVID-19, I just wanna do something. Convalescent plasma, is an age old treatment, let's use that. We can't just use it. There was a, a five study 
um, review of it that was published in JAMA, three patients were discharged home and two didn't die. So they said, okay, Mayo Clinic, that's good enough. You can, you can do your study. So they did. And the title of their study here after 5,000 patients is Early Safety Indications of Convalescent Plasma. And I circle early indications suggest and is safe because with 5,000 patients, you ought to be able to do a slam dunk relationship or not with people who have had convalescent plasma or not. And the reason they couldn't is because they had no placebo group. You may or may not remember that if you entered into the Mayo study, which was the only way to get convalescent plasma, you got convalescent plasma and there was no placebo group. And so they could only tell you that it was safe. They couldn't really tell you if it was decreasing mortality. The study swelled to 20,000 people. And in this paper, they ask the question, does transfusion of human convalescent plasma reduce mortality among hospitalized COVID-19 patients? That's a good question that this article couldn't answer because again, there's no placebo group. What they could do though, creatively, was compare patients to themselves. And so they categorized patients into three categories. Those whose plasma had a low amount of antibodies, medium or high. So you've got three categories of patients. Meanwhile, the study swells to over 35,000 people. And so what these categories showed was these data demonstrate a clear dose dependent relationship of reduced seven day mortality with the higher antibody levels. And they saw the same thing with the 30 day mortalities, the figures um, were similar. And so the seven days I put right here, I wanna emphasize it says clear dose dependent relationship. To me, it's not clear. When you have uh, a difference, then you're gonna have, everybody knows that a relative risk of one means you're neither for it nor against it, it's one. And these confidence intervals cross one, both of them, when you compare low to medium or low to high. Okay, the, the other thing I can see visually is that these bars overlap. They overlap a lot. And so I wanna change their data for just a moment so you can appreciate what bars that don't overlap look like. It would be this, okay? See the gap in between the bars? So visually, that is where there's gonna be a relationship. And so I changed the confidence intervals to be all on the same side of one, as you see from 2.1 to 4.4 but that's not really the data. So let me change it back so you know what it looks like. Um, this is, uh, if you notice in the right-hand corner, it says preprint. A preprint means that it has not undergone peer review. And I couldn't find where this paper was ever actually published. And I'm not surprised. Then we started to have some observational perspective studies uh, published. This one had um, 542 patients, 188 patients in each arm. And so 188 patients got convalescent plasma, 188 patients did not. And they compared the demographics of the two groups of people so that they are pretty similar. They compared a lot of um, factors. As you see, uh, it was matched for all these factors on the left, including the type of COVID-19 uh, treatment that was given if treatment was given. If you look at the bottom graph, you'll notice that the difference in mortality, these lines are nearly on top of each other. And so uh, there was visually not a, uh, a difference in mortality. The length of stay is on the top and the control actually uh, was discharged slightly later, but the difference in these two lines for control and treatment were not statistically significant. So this study, concluded that there wasn't a benefit in outcomes. Then in nature comes finally the randomized controlled trial for convalescent plasma um, that we can look at. It had 900 patients and they were matched two to one, meaning two people got convalescent plasma for every one who got placebo. And so the, uh, the confidence intervals there, you can see they cross one. So there was not a difference for this outcome. 32% versus 28% in placebo, that difference is not statistically significant. So convalescent plasma was not offering a benefit. There was a, a benefit. I mean, not, there was a difference with the adverse events. The people who got convalescent plasma had slightly more adverse events than the people who got placebo. 
And that difference was significant. As you can see, the p-value is less than 0.05. So when you look at this visually, these lines are nearly on top of each other again. The dashed line is length of stay. And the standard of care group was being discharged slightly sooner, earlier than the convalescent plasma group. The people um, mortality, the people that got plasma were uh, dying slightly more, but neither one of these differences is again, statistically significant. So their conclusion was that there was not a benefit in trial. Now they didn't get to enroll all that they wanted to, but if you could see that this was not trending in the right direction, so they stopped the trial early. The trial was terminated at 78% of planned enrollment after meeting stopping criteria for futility. And if you wanna see futility, it's in the Mayo study, which ultimately enrolled 105,717 patients. Wow. They concluded finally in their last paper that it was safe. Well, we knew that 100,000 patients ago, right? And they also did, to their credit, show that it was feasible to carry out mass administration. So if there is a pandemic where people need lots of transfusions of something, the United States is capable of doing that. And you see all these yellow dots everywhere across the United States, and there's one there for Louisville, because we too participated in the convalescent plasma trial. We just wanted to do something. Okay, so now let's move on to our modern day um, treatment, which was the monoclonal antibodies. So for this, they would take the blood out of the patient, but then they would engineer it slightly. And in the animal studies, they took healthy mice, uh, exposed them to COVID-19, and then transferred it to mice who had been uh, infected with COVID-19, and they lived. And so then they said, okay, let's try it in humans. So there were um, animal studies and then in vivo studies. The problem is that the COVID-19 virus was mutating faster than the engineers could re-engineer the COVID-19 that they were extracting from patients. And so at this time, the FDA does not uh, approve any monoclonal antibodies. Now I did hear of somebody getting some last month and I decided the doctor didn't know that and the pharmacist just happened to have it still on the shelf from before, so they fulfilled the order. So I, I wanna emphasize that there is a difference between um, antitoxin and inactivated toxin. Inactivated toxin is when you have the toxin, in this case of diphtheria, it's weakened and then it's um, injected into somebody and the antigen presenting cells take that up, notify the B cells who make antibodies and those are ready for any infection. Whereas the antitoxin, is the serum from a horse that has antibodies. It's for somebody who actively has diphtheria and those um, go and kill the diphtheria. And so this is a one and done treatment. And so what they did was they combined these two to make a vaccine. And I wanna use that as a, a segue to talk about the COVID-19 vaccines. But uh, before I do, this is, I wanna show you an old bottle of the diphtheria toxin. And uh, it wasn't always a success story. This started in New York City, started to move its way west across the country. And in St. Louis, there was a bottle of this diphtheria antitoxin that was contaminated with tetanus toxin. So when they treated these children, uh, about a dozen of them ended up dying of tetanus. And so the US government said, okay, we need some regulation. And so I wanna put this laboratory in charge of that. And that laboratory is now called the National Institutes of Health. Um, another fun story was that as this antitoxin moved its way across the United States, it fulfilled the lower 48. And so the last place, the last frontier is Alaska, right? And so there was a shipment to go into Nome, Alaska, but the, they couldn't get it there in time because the ship froze in, I mean, the shipyard froze in. And so the Alaskan governor arranged a uh, train to take it up there, which it did, but it was, it could only get within 670 miles. And so they arranged sled dogs and a gentleman to take the rest of the way. <coughs> now, uh, the distance for that is like going from here to Kansas City, a long way for sled dog treatment. I mean, travel. And the whole United States was wrapped up in, you know, how far is this getting? 
um, each day and I guess he'd radio in. And so, uh, you know, what do we get wrapped up in these days? I, I was thinking maybe the Olympics were here and they, they carried the torch across the United States. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> we, we get caught up in like the Kardashians or something. They have so much more noble uh, things they were used to be uh, trying for. Anyway, when I talk about COVID-19 uh, vaccine, it really helps to remind, uh, remember the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. So uh, in a moment here, remember COVID-19 is an RNA virus. It attaches to the angiotensin II receptor, and then it's enveloped in the cell. The RNA is taken and transcribed by our ribosomes into proteins. Those proteins are reassembled into COVID-19, and then it's expelled from the cell. So let's look first at the mechanism of action of the mRNA vaccine. This mRNA is uh, just the mRNA of the spike protein, not the entire COVID-19. And so that's what's injected, and that mRNA goes into our cells, our ribosomes, transcribe it to proteins, our Golgi apparatuses, assemble it, and then the spike proteins are expressed on the surface of the cell. And just hold that thought of there because that's where all these vaccines end. With the mechanism of action of the viral vector vaccines, which is the J&J, &J, it's a DNA vaccine that's housed in a weakened adenovirus. Okay, and so that's what's injected into our bodies. The DNA goes all the way into our nucleus where it's translated to um, RNA. Then the RNA is, exits to the cytoplasm where our ribosomes transcribe it, the proteins, our Golgi apparatus assembles it, and then these spike proteins are expressed on the surface of the cell. There's one more vaccine, right? The FDA has approved Novavax, which means new vaccine, even though it's not, what's well, the newest vaccine? Perhaps that's where they got this, the name. Anyway, this is a DNA uh, virus, also just for the spike protein. And it's housed in not adenovirus, but baculovirus, one we've never heard of. And then it's translated to RNA in the lab. And then the RNA is transcribed to the spike proteins in the lab and assembled into a little uh, module and that's what's in the syringe and that's what goes in your body. It doesn't need to use our ribosomes and Golgi apparatus, but the spike proteins are there. Okay, so um, let's move over and see how, what happens now. Our antigen presenting cells recognize these spike proteins regardless of the vaccine. And then those are presented and it goes to um, recognized by two different cells. The first one is a T helper cell that is then activated which notifies the B cells, which make antibodies. The antibodies, if you're exposed to COVID-19, surround the COVID-19 such that the uh, angiotensin receptor, it, it can't bind because it's got antibodies all over it. The other cell that it identifies is the T killer cell. So the T killer cell seeks out our cells that are already infected with COVID-19 and kill them. So I want to go over the difference between vaccine efficacy and effectiveness. We hear those two terms. Um, efficacy is in a randomized controlled trial. It is the risk reduction of the vaccine group compared to the placebo group. Risk reduction of the vaccine group. Effectiveness is also, it's like a retrospective analysis of the same measurement. Now, I am a simple guy. Those too many words for me, efficacy and effectiveness. So let me just break it down. Efficacy is research and effectiveness is real world. I got that. Um, if you can imagine in the real world, there's a question, uh, well, how long did that vial of vaccine sit on the counter, really? But in research, everything's at a slower pace. There's a, a lot more attention paid to those kind of details. Did the nurse inject it subcutaneously or intramuscularly? Well, for research, they have to take another course to inject the vaccine even though they already know how to do it. And then um, the, in a, a real world study, if they go on to get COVID-19, did they actually have COVID-19 that morning? They just didn't have symptoms yet. And then they went and got the vaccine and say, oh, I'm a breakthrough case. Well, in research, you get a COVID-19 just before you get the vaccine so that 
we know whether or not you have COVID-19 when you get the vaccine. And so the numbers are always better for, in the research for the efficacy than they are for the effectiveness. And let me show you where they, how they calculate these. Let's take a study, 100 patients in each arm. The placebo patients, there's 110 of them go on to get infected with COVID-19. The vaccine uh, arm is 100 patients, but only two of them go on to get vaccine. So you've got eight fewer people in the vaccine arm who are infected than in the placebo arm. And that difference, eight out of 10, is 80%. And so they'll say the efficacy is 80%. So in, in an effectiveness study, this is real world, same study, 100 patients, uh, three go on to get COVID-19 in the vaccine arm. There was 10 in the placebo, and the, there were seven more patients who, who uh, were protected in the vaccine arm. So that's seven out of 10, and the effectiveness is 70%, slightly lower in this case. And that's usually the case, that the effectiveness is always lower. So let's look at a New England Journal uh, publication that showed people, if you remember, you got two shots in the beginning, about a month apart, and then a third. And so uh, even though this was at the beginning, New England just recently published this, these people got Moderna, Moderna, and then for the third shot, some of them got Moderna and some of them got Pfizer. If you look here, this is the Delta variant. variant. The effectiveness was nearly 100% in the beginning, and as time and the weeks went by, the, it went down. And then they got a booster there at about 25 weeks, and it, and it went back up. The Omicron variant, as you remember, uh, had lower effectiveness. And then as time went on, it drastically um, decreased down to less than 20%, but then the booster put it back up to the 80%. Now, these are the people who got Moderna, 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 all right? Now, what about the people who got Moderna, Moderna, Pfizer? They're, they also were boosted up at about the same level. And in fact, they're so close, I overlaid these two so you could appreciate them. So if you're gonna say there is a difference between the Pfizer and Moderna arm in that third shot, then it's a pretty low news day because there's really not much of a difference at all. They also looked at another group of uh, people, those people who got the Pfizer vaccine. And I remember I got the Pfizer vaccine and then one of the people that works with me said, Dr. Arnold, you gotta spice it up. So I got a Moderna. So in this study, I would have been in the top. Other people got Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer. So as you see, they got the vaccine. Delta was easier to kill than Omicron or protect against uh, Omicron. You got the, um, as time went on, the vaccine immunity waned, the booster did boost. And uh, over time again, it started to wane. So if you look at the people who got Pfizer, Pfizer, Moderna, it's nearly the same. When you overlay them on top of each other, this overlay shows that, uh, Moderna was slightly better. I don't know if there's a statistical difference there, but that it is what it is. It probably is not clinically noticeable, but maybe statistically. So now let me try to answer the question of why triple demic. Uh, we've got these three viruses, and this season we've had them all substantial at the same time, roughly. The first reason, and this sounds funny from an infectious diseases doctor, but COVID-19 is just still around. If you think about MERS that came left and we hardly ever see it, COVID-19 is still here. It's not going away. We've lost the masks, but COVID-19 is going to be a yearly thing. I anticipate that we get vaccinated against every year because it's still here. Um, so the fact that uh, COVID-19 is around is not too much of a surprise, especially in the winter season. So I anticipate that we'll get one vaccine from now on each year. If we look at how it is in Kentucky, uh, we have a moderate amount of, of COVID-19. We have some surrounding states that are higher, Tennessee and West Virginia, but then Virginia is a little lower. So um, we seem to be in a transition zone there. If you look at county by county, it's a little tough to make out Kentucky because the highest area in Kentucky on the eastern part and the western part of West Virginia is also rather high. And so the border kind of blends there. Uh, you can see the, the inferior aspect of it where 
uh, butts up against Tennessee. But again, it seems that our edges, especially over near Evansville, when it bleeds over into Illinois, those are areas where it's higher. Um, if, an easier way to appreciate this is to look at this county by county map of Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky has the highest and then medium or the least amount is in um, the green. And so you can uh, pick out where we are. I don't have a laser, but or maybe I do. Anyway, you know where we are. Um, this is the entire pandemic summarized. And so in the beginning there above January 28th, uh, if you recall, that part of the pandemic was severe. We had a lot of people and uh, that was followed by everybody going on Christmas break and exchanging COVID-19. So that's your first huge spike. And then people came home and they went on for a summer break and they did it again. I'm not sure which button it is anyway. Uh, and then Christmas came again and you've got that ginormous spike. And what this graph says is 800,000 people per week were getting COVID-19 in the United States. I don't remember being that high, but I mean, the data is here. Then they came back and went on vacation again for summer. And now we, uh, it seems to be trending down. Good. The other thing you'll notice about this is on the bottom where the, uh, it says in red deaths, it's flatlined at zero. But is it really? We all know there was thousands and thousands of deaths due to COVID-19. And so what I did was um, I left the COVID-19 with the left axis up to 800,000, but then changed the uh, right axis for mortality up to 3000. And so now we can kind of see how many people were dying and when. And in the very beginning, the amount of deaths were out of proportion to the number of people who had it. Remember there's two different scales on the right and left. And then you get that surge about uh, January, 2021 at Christmas. And now the deaths and the, um, the incidence of COVID-19 the ratio is different and it's in favor of people not dying as much. Uh, and then you've got the summer after that and the huge Christmas spike there that went way up. You have so many more people getting COVID-19, but not so many more deaths. Um, and then you've seen the last six months that uh, we've had some deaths. They're coming down and uh, COVID-19 is still around, as I say, but uh, it's not the menace it was. So this predicts where how many deaths we'll have in Kentucky, which is uh, to reach close to 19,000 by late spring. So now I want to say another reason why the triple demic, triple de yeah, triple demic and COVID-19 is the resistance. So COVID-19 is a difficult target. Okay, with it changing and these mutations. It's, it's difficult not only to treat, but it's also to prevent. And so here is a strip of the entire gene showing multiple areas where you have mutations. So the um, red ones are ones that change an amino acid, and the blue ones are mutations that don't result in a change of the amino acid. The most important part of this is the brown S there, because that's the spike protein, and that's the area that our vaccines are engineered to uh, mimic. And so if you have a mutation in that brown section that's red, that means that the vaccine may be less likely to work. And that's another reason. So we have what's called variants of concern. It's actually less than it was just three months ago. Um, they're all Omicron lineages and we're down to just B.1.1.529. And then you have these VUMs variants under monitor. And so characteristics of variants of concern are that they cause COVID that's easily transmissible, that's highly pathogenic. They has immune escape, which means the va uh, vaccines don't work. It has diagnostic escape, which means your test may be false positive or false negative. And it has therapeutic escape, which means the treatment may not work. And so sometimes people have in their head, well, the COVID-19 is outsmarting us humans, but COVID-19 and all those genes I just showed you, it doesn't have a brain. So uh, it's probably more accurate to say that COVID-19, it's making mutations every day all the time. And most of them result in even in death of the COVID-19. It's a sloppy uh, replicator. And so uh, when you have a variant, 
that's more transmissible, well, it, it's transmissed more by definition. If it's causing higher um, pathogenicity, then those are the people who get admitted. If you have mild COVID, you stay at home and you're isolated. Well, it's difficult for your COVID-19 to be transmitted if you're staying at home. And so what we do in a sense is give it the opportunity to spread and it takes advantage of that. And so if uh, somebody with severe COVID-19 is admitted, then they're exposed to how many healthcare workers, young, old, and then, you know, some healthcare workers, they were wearing their uh, masks on their mouth. Some were doing chin straps. Some had them on their forehead. You saw these people. And so they might get COVID-19 and then accidentally share it with one of their patients who's immunosuppressed. And so it gets transmitted that way. So it's not really outsmarting us as um, just taking advantage of opportunities. I want you to appreciate the COVID-19 variants. There's, uh, when we say Omicron or we say Delta, it's uh, hundreds of variants. And, and Beta does not have all the Alpha variants plus some more. Um, and then Gamma has all those plus more. No, it's, it's like the variants are, they name these differently because it's, uh, they've taken off in different directions. And so Delta was pretty bad and transmissible. Omicron was severe, and now it's just exploded into uh, so many different variants. Um, what you have on the left is just a key, a color key. And so at the bottom, in the early November before Thanksgiving, the predominant variants were BA5 and BQ1. And so just like good enemy, when you kill them, they're replaced with one who's worse. And so BQ1 led to BQ1.1, and now they're X-rated and we're up to XBB1.5, and um, they just keep uh, cycling through different variants. And so now as of early February, is we have XBB1.5 and BQ1.1. So another reason for the triple demic, it's our population at risk. Uh, when we think back to who COVID-19, um, who, who died due to that, it was our most vulnerable population. And maybe one of the reasons that our mortality is not as bad is because COVID-19 has simply killed those people off. And that's, it's a tragedy in itself, right? Because uh, those people succumb to COVID-19, but there's also elderly people with comorbidities who are following right in their footsteps and uh, could move into that. We all know that a comorbidity will increase the mortality of COVID-19. And so you see with each one of these comorbidities, it's um, increased slightly. A one would be your uh, normal. And then here, like obesity is up to 1.3. And if you combine comorbidities, that's when your mortality becomes even higher. But in Kentucky, remember that we are an elderly state. We have lots of older adults. And so that is a, a severe. So look at this, you could have nine comorbidities. I'm in that category age-wise, that's terrifying to see. And so when we see our older adults wearing masks where we think they're silly, they're not. They appreciate this graph, 85 and older has a 10 times risk of mortality just for being old, not even with the comorbidities. That's impressive. These people with influenza and RSV now are the same populations, the very young, and the very old, you know, there uh, is no RSV vaccine. Influenza vaccine um, is good, but if you don't take it, then you're left vulnerable. And we've talked about older adults and comorbidities. So let me say a word just about influenza for a moment. This is a, a graph of how each year has, uh, has gone in the United States. And you see most of our Seasons are between the end of the year around Christmas till early March. Um, but this year, uh, at the beginning of the designated season, which is a 40th week, which is about October, this season uh, hit the ground running. And so I would argue that this season didn't start on the 40th week. If the beginning of the season was the end of last year. And so it started about the 32nd week, that orange line led into this season. And so the influenza season this year actually started in August and, and increased. And so that may be one reason we see such an early spike that timed itself with COVID-19 and RSV. So um, 
this is how influenza has been in Kentucky. It's pretty much followed the national curve. The scale's a little different, so it looks spread out, but it's still a spike. And fortunately, it looks like we're about finished with our peak season. Un unfortunately, their influenza B always follows influenza A. So we don't know what the next spike is going to be, right? Our influenza A has been mostly H3N2, which is seasonal influenza. H1N1 is your 20, uh, 19, 17, 18 pandemic that was uh, renewed in 2009. And we've had this pandemic every year since 2009. And that's another reason I say we're gonna have COVID-19 every year since 2020, because uh, it just doesn't go away. What happens is the population gets uh, more and more exposed and immune to it. And so uh, our H1N1, uh, you haven't even heard about that in the news, but it's there and uh, it's not as severe as it was in 2009 when it was uh, so severe. So um, more about influenza, it changes every one to two years. Now contrast this to COVID-19, which changes every few months. So it's a little easier to make vaccines for this. On the surface of the influenza, you have hemagglutinin and neuraminic acid. A drift is just a mutation within the influenza. But a shift is when the influenza is borrowing genetic material from something else and incorporating it into itself. And now you have a new influenza, so they give it a new name. So this H1N1, if it borrowed some from a bird, could be H5N1. And so that's where that comes about. The vaccine makers have to guess correctly for our vaccine, but fortunately they have a little help from the Southern hemisphere. Um, they do have to pick the vaccine though very early in their season. So they don't have the benefit of months to see which variant you know, really uh, was most predominant in a season. And so what we have now are quadrivalent. We used to just have one and that's when they really didn't work very well. There's two types. Um, all of them have one, two, and three here, but one of them is egg-based from Victoria, and one of them is recombinant-based from Wisconsin. And um, if you want to know which one you got, then you just have to look on the box. So let me say a word about RSV. I would argue that uh, the pandemic this time, not uh, well, the triple-demic, is due to RSV coming a little earlier and a little higher for the last several years. So we've been building up to this. You see in 2018 and 19, it was the first week of March, and this is measuring hospitalized cases per 100,000 people, which was at a certain level. The next year, 2019 and 2020, it was a little sooner and a little higher. The next year didn't count because that was COVID-19 and RSV was flat. The next year, it was a little higher and a little sooner. And the next year, which is this year, it was a little sooner, same amount of sooner, but extremely higher. And so we've been building up to this uh, severe RSV season for several years. It didn't just come out of the blue. So th there's been this thing called, that I think uh, is rebound influenza and RSV. And so I told you that the 2020, 2021 influenza and RSV, those, those years were flat. We hardly had anybody with influenza as an inpatient or outpatient. And so we had near zero infections, good. But at the same time, you had an entire population who was not exposed to these viruses and didn't make antibodies. So uh, this, is, this can be made up for, but if you have a population who doesn't get exposed with influ influenza, then you can give them a vaccine to make up for that. But as you see, our vaccines in Kentucky, they're flat through these years. So now this vulnerable population can, uh, is set up to get influenza. For RSV, yes, we have an adult RSV study, but there's no uh, FDA approved RSV vaccine. So when you don't have a whole population who gets RSV that usually does, now you've kind of got a whole population of people in limbo waiting and they got it this year. For COVID-19 vaccines, um, we've had 67% in Kentucky who've had at least one dose, which I, I would argue is about useless, right? One dose from before. Only 11.6% in Kentucky have had a bivalent booster. So we're setting ourselves up again, um, unless these 
for perhaps a summer uh, surge. I'd like to be done till at least next um, Christmas when uh, winter season comes again and flu season. And so hopefully we'll do a better job of vaccinating our people for COVID-19 before that uh, next season. For influenza, we're 48.5% um, in Kentucky. Actually, I think the percent as of two days ago was 49.3 and uh, children is slightly less. So perhaps we can look at this county by county who has been vaccinated in Kentucky. And this is all kind of pale, which means we haven't done too good a job of um, vaccinating for COVID-19. So I expanded it so you could see the region and see a contrast and then compared it to how much COVID-19 there is right now. So if you look, I really need a pointer. Anyway, if you look up in Minnesota, they've done a good job of vaccinating on the right with a dark blue, but on the left, it's all pale green and that kind of goes together. There's other areas that don't go together. If you look at Connecticut, it's bright red with COVID-19, but they did a pretty good job of vaccinating on the right. In Kentucky, Jefferson County, Lexington area has done pretty well with uh, vaccinating and, and those areas are green. Um, there is just to the west of Lexington, a couple red counties where it's severe. That's where Red River Gorge is. I think that's why it's red. I don't know. Anyway, the Research Triangle in North Carolina did a good job of vaccinating, as you can see. And they're not green, they're yellow, but they're surrounded by high uh, COVID-19 that's in red around them. So perhaps that goes together. I would say if you go through the map and kind of mix and match different areas, you'll find that some areas match up and some don't. So the message there is that the vaccines help, they're just not 100%. And I don't think anybody has ever uh, said it, it would be 100%, um, but in general, it does help. So I want you to think about our what we can do against um, COVID-19, the flu is what it says at the top there, it's just distancing, vaccines, wearing a mask, these preventive things. And I know there's uh, maybe some political differences about if stuff works, but, but if we just think about as a community, common sense. So if I have COVID-19 and you don't, the further you are from me, the less likely you are to get it, okay? If I have COVID-19 and you don't, and I wear a mask, you're less likely to get it. If I have COVID-19 and you don't, and you've been vaccinated, then you're less likely to get it if you're exposed. And so these are the things that we can do, but you know, in uh, just like in the Blue Ridge Mountains here, whenever, sometimes there's a defect and the virus is gonna find the defect and go to that population. Now, the, the population of the United States does not look like a Blue Ridge Mountain with one big wall. It looks more like Eastern Kentucky. That's just, you have these islands of people who are distancing and masking and vaccinating amongst a whole other population who is not. And so the virus will just work through the population who's most vulnerable and, and find it until it's all around us. And so uh, we really need to do what we can to prevent from getting these viruses. So now I wanna circle back to our case patient that I presented at the beginning. She actually in the ER tested COVID-19 positive and her oxygenation improved. She was discharged home on a three-day regimen of remdesivir. She got one dose in the ER and two at home. And then she recovered, it's so good for her. And with that, I wanna end my talk and entertain any questions that you might have at this time. Thank you. Really fantastic, Dr. Arnold. First question, let's go back to your last few slides. Um, there, you were really relating the incidence not, uh, of uh, COVID to the vaccination with those slides, but there's supposed to be a disconnect. And so don't you think that perhaps some of what we're seeing and that variation around the country is who is surveilling actually testing as opposed to people who are vaccinated, they get COVID, it's no big deal, they're not reporting. And so you would get such a sort of an underestimate of incidence because the vaccine is so good at stopping the illness. It's not stopping them from getting it, it's just stopping them from reporting it. Yeah, and also those are reported by where you live. 
And as we know, there's so much travel. And so one group of people in a county may travel a lot more, like this county probably has, uh, I would guess, more people traveling than, say, in eastern Kentucky County, where there's not as much travel. Um, but I don't know. I, there's, I just know that's a big variable, and it's very hard to attribute county to county. Um, but you have to report it somehow, and that's as good enough as any. Any other I get asked COVID-19 questions all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is your time for me not to turn you down. Let's see. Let's go to chat. All right. Uh, okay, one's from Dr. Levinson. And he want me to read it or I mean, you can kind of see it maybe. Um, said, thank you for the nice, very nice, clear, unbiased talk. Question, is it possible that the one protein, protein RNA, is less effective than a total virus vaccine attenuated live HB, you know, the terms. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, measles, highly infectious, but live attenuate, attenuated virus after all antibody against whole virus produces many antibodies against other protein that may not have mutated. All right, I saw a question mark in there. Yeah. <laughs> is it possible that one protein is less effective than a total virus vaccine attenuated live? Um, I guess he means protein uh, vaccine. And so the, the third, the Novavax vaccine is uh, a protein that's injected and um, we're probably waiting on effectiveness studies. Um, now, the theory is that it's, um, you know, they wouldn't have made it if they didn't think it was gonna work well, right? Uh, so that's the, that's the hope. And then perhaps other vaccines are to follow. He says measles um, as, as one example, and I know, um, Influenza is trying to make an mRNA virus, but that's not the protein. Anyway, I, that probably wasn't a very good answer, but um, why don't we yeah. move on to the next thing? Uh, I think what they were really getting at is like NMR, uh, those are all live attenuated viruses, right? And so the idea is that you could take the whole thing and you, but it, I think what they were trying to get at is that there's more than just the spike protein to try to, uh, things that you could attach on, you could. Could react to so many other things if you use the live attenuated virus. I'm just wondering, you know, why was that uh, rejected out of hand? I think it had to do with the fact that this uh, this uh, idea of um, messenger RNA was sitting around waiting for something to do. Mm -hmm. And and I, now that seemed to be my impression is that that's what happened, and we fell into it. You could produce it uh, extremely rapidly. Yeah, which we needed, and they probably went after the spike protein just because it was out there and is the first contact, um, I'm guessing, but perhaps the proteins will show something. I have a question from Dr. Pfeiffer. It says, what is the status of research and our understanding of people seemingly naturally immune to COVID and in any implications? Yeah, um, I haven't kept up with the naturally immune to COVID, but we definitely have seen people who've been exposed multiple times and uh, haven't gotten it. And you've experienced that even in your own families where it'll rip through a family, but Johnny over here doesn't get it. It's like, why is that? Uh, so that's a good topic to, to, to do. We have the same thing in HIV where you'll have people that have HIV, but they don't progress. Why are they long-term non-progressors? Why are these people kind of in the same category with COVID? And the last question is from Swapna. I know it's Dale. I know she's associated with our endocrinology group. Says, thanks for a great talk. Vaccination percentages can be increased in children by providing school vaccination services with opt-out option. This route doesn't seem to be utilized much. It's more of a comment than a question. Um, right. But we, I think successful vaccination results in multiple methods, and that's one that probably should be taken advantage of, certainly. Awesome. So I think that's all of our questions from the chat. Is anybody in the audience still? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm curious about your thoughts about the way that we can increase your convalescence capacity in the virus. So 
with remdesivir early on, we were given it to everybody. And eventually we kind of acknowledged there were really different phases of COVID. There was the viral phase, and then you had the symptomatic phase. And once we started using remdesivir earlier in the course, the efficacy looked a heck of a lot better than early in this pandemic when we were given it. Do you think the convalescent plasma cell makes up the same shotgun approach rather than really trying to understand is there a specific niche for this treatment? Um, yeah, so that niche probably included giving it early. Maybe it was the people who had higher antibody levels, like the donors. And if there were three or four other factors, maybe there was a small group of people who would have been a good candidate for the convalescent plasma. That's been used um, you know, decades ago with strep pneumo and different things that are pretty common. We just have antibiotics now, so we usually give them, but we don't have antivirals. So that's kind of why they went there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Just a, I mean, it's just a, a personal note, just a quick note. Dr. Arnold, you're the first in-person grand round speaker since March 12th of 2020 in this very room. It was actually in this very room. So <laughs> good. Congratulations. You brought us back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>